in reality, what we want to be thinking about is that these are actually muscles that we can develop. And if we learn what they are, we get to understand the nuances of what makes strong character for an individual. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the KTS Success Factor podcast for women where we talk about challenges senior female leaders face in being happy and successful at work. I'm your host, Dr. Sarah E. Brown. My guest today is Dr. Mary Crossan. She is a distinguished university professor and professor of strategic leadership at the Ivy Business School of Western University. In 2021, she was recognized on a global list representing the top 2% of the most cited scientists in her discipline. And in 2023, she received the Lifetime Career Achievement from the Academy of Management Distinguished Educator Awards. Her research on leader character, organizational learning, and strategic renewal and Improvisation is published in over a hundred articles and books. And she has written a book called The Character Compass, which is what we will be talking about today. Welcome, Mary. Great to be here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your research. How do you research this topic? Well, I have to admit that I've been about close to 40 years in research, and I wish I had come across leader character earlier in my research. And it was in the 2008 economic crisis that we were looking at the failures of leadership. And long story short, a lot of the work that we were doing revealed that what we were missing was not so much competence, but we were missing character. But people didn't know what it was or how to develop it. So when you ask, how do we study it? Well, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, you go back to Confucius, Aristotle, Plato, the importance of character for flourishing, human flourishing has long been recognized. And then in about 2004, Martin Seligman, former president of the American Psychological Association, weighed in on it. And he and Christopher Peterson did some research that identified these aspects of a character that were universal across time, culture, even religion. So that's really the kind of the backdrop of how we got into it. And really, in the last 15 years, we've been working at trying to develop the toolkit on how we can actually understand character, assess it and develop it. Okay, I'm going to talk about how to assess it and develop it in a minute. But first of all, how do you define it? What is character? Can you give me an example? Right. Well, in its broadest sense, character is a set. We think about it like anatomy and physiology of the body. And so there are 11 dimensions of character. So a lot of times people think, oh, character is all about ethics or it's all about integrity or it's all about grit. And that's what we've got wrong about it. It's not all about one thing. It actually has this kind of quality of this interconnected set of dimensions. So let's just walk through those a little bit. Judgment is in the middle. Uh, That's what Aristotle called practical wisdom. But judgment draws on 10 other dimensions. And and I'll just kind of step through those. But each one of them has a set of behaviors that an individual can develop. So they are transcendence. And that's that quality of seeing possibilities in the future, real uplift that people have in their being. Drive. A lot of people already know those things like drive, collaboration, humanity, humility, integrity, temperance, which is kind of an odd word these days, but it is around your patience and calm and how it is you handle and self regulate under pressure, justice, accountability, and not surprising courage. And Sarah, I think the most profound part of this that we have got wrong in this area is because people have thought, oh, it's all about grit, or it's all about one thing or another, we miss the major point that any potential virtue would operate like a vice in excess or deficiency. But if I put it another way, if you're going to have a lot of drive, you also need a lot of humanity and temperance in the other dimensions to support it. 
And I think, Sarah, the key insight for a lot of women is particularly female leaders is we get thrown around an awful lot about, well, who are you supposed to be? And I think the architecture of character starts to help us understand why we have found ourselves being asked to do things like, oh, tone ourselves down or, or elevate this or look like that. And in reality, what we want to be thinking about is that these are actually muscles that we can develop. And if we learn what they are, we get to understand the nuances of what makes strong character for an individual. Okay, so how do you develop these muscles? Mm, Great question. We've spent an awful lot of time on the development side because actually understanding what it is, it's like we think about that's the starting point. We often use the analogy, you got to go to the character gym, meaning just the same way you would go and go and work out in a gym and lift your weights or do your cardio or whatever you're going to do. We have to begin treating our character in that way, in an intentional way to say, so what am I doing to develop my transcendence? Or what am I doing to develop my integrity or my humility or my humanity? And there we've got lots of tools in the toolkit. There's an assessment, a leader character insight assessment that's available through a a company called Sigma Assessment Systems. We ourselves developed an app called Virtuosity that you can put in your hand. And that's the kind of thing that just gives you exercises every day that would get you thinking about how am I actually going to develop these particular behaviors? I would say, Sarah, about this, uh, you know, the science is so well developed about this that we know what, what we need to develop. We know how to develop it. And really the big challenge is character is habit. Mm -hmm. So the question is, How are you actually going to change the habit? Mm -hmm. And that's where that analogy of, let's say, going to the gym Mm -hmm. is really a good one. And I I think for a lot of leaders, they didn't really know what it is that they could do or how practical it would be to say, what am I going to do investing five minutes every day that's going to change every other minute of my day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you talked about an assessment. Do you deal with that in your book? We do. We do talk about that. We've got a couple of chapters in the book that both talk about assessment and they talk about the development side, even talk about the app itself and how that can be used. You know, it's interesting, Sarah, because around character development, it is fascinating to me how I I look at, you know, so many women who don't see themselves as you know, a person who's going to be in a leadership position. And we talk about as the disposition to lead Mm -hmm. and that the essence for great leadership actually lies in your character. So now if you have this really accessible roadmap that says, well, how am I actually going to become somebody, you know, who has more transcendence or drive or courage or accountability? Number one, you've got a pathway to develop it. But I think also for a lot of your listeners, They also really struggle with issues around, you know, stress, anxiety, lack of confidence and certainty about how they operate. And they haven't really understood that much of that is actually anchored in these muscles of character that they could develop and they could begin to understand, well, what is the pathway then for me to be able to do it? I'll give you a practical example about it. Something like confidence. You know, I hear this an awful lot from women, you know, they feel that they lack confidence. They don't want to, maybe they have trouble public speaking or something around that. And we say, well, your confidence may not be around, you know, lacking the courage to do it because you probably have the courage set up, but maybe you're being really hard on yourself. Maybe there are issues about your humility that give you that idea around your vulnerability to step into a space that's unknown and difficult and you know, be kind with yourself about how you're going to operate in that space. So if you take that and link it to something like imposter syndrome, which many people talk about, and I'm a big fan of Ann Burry, who who talked about the fact that, well, let's not label it as imposter syndrome, you know, because we're not imposters and it's actually not a syndrome. 
to quote her, it's an escapable part of being alive. And in particularly for women, she picks up this idea when you're crossing thresholds, that is you're in systems and spaces that haven't necessarily been all that friendly to, you know, and it could be anything, could be your, you know, race, sexual orientation, gender, you name it, any marginalized, you know, part of who we are, we are all in systems that haven't necessarily been very favorable to us. And what she talks about is that you're not an imposter. You're actually just in a system that wasn't designed for you. And when you begin to then think about character, you begin to think about it as these muscles that help you navigate a system that was never designed for you. And how are you going to operate not only in the system, but on the system? And doing so, I think, starts to reduce things like stress and anxiety because you're not kind of struggling with the fact that, oh, my gosh, I'm an imposter here, but rather you belong. And now the job is how do you, you know, take that in that spirit of being alive as you kind of navigate those difficult spaces? Mm. You talked about confidence, and I'm just looking at your chart of these 11 dimensions, and it's not one of them. Well, if you take a look, it's under courage. So okay. under, so it's the behavior. If you look at those behaviors under courage, being brave, determined, tenacious, resilient, and confident. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, and, and here we pick up that even something like, you know, tenacity and determination, they kind of really align with grit. And, you know, sometimes it's back to this thing. People say, oh, it's all about grit. But that area has been also under fire because let's take a look at it. Grit, if it operates in its, you know, excess state, you're stubborn. You know, you're ending up, you know, being that person that doesn't, you know, you resist things. You, you don't actually have the judgment to say, at what point is this the time to stop what I'm doing here? And think about then you need these other dimensions of character like temperance, being patient or calm or humility or humanity or collaboration to say, geez, I've got all that, you know, tenaciousness and determination. But if I'm weak on things like collaboration and humility, they may be operating in their vice state. And that becomes pretty, I, I think, compelling for many women to go, oh my gosh, that's me. You know, hmm. that's why I'm struggling. How do you know whether you've got these in balance? Hi, this is Sarah Brown again, the host of the KTS Success Factor podcast for women. I hope you are enjoying this episode and gaining some tips and inspiration on how you can be happier, more successful, and experience less stress at work. If you would like to learn more about how you can empower the women in your organization to do the same, simply click on the show notes to see how you can connect with me. As an added bonus for my podcast guests, you will see how you can book 30 minutes with me to explore how you can implement a scalable self-coaching program for the women in your organization. Simply visit Book a chat with sarahebrown.com. Now back to this informative episode. I love that question. You know, there's a chart we have in the book that lists every single one of these 62 behaviors that are associated with the 11 dimensions. And it lists them in their deficient state and their excess state. And I think what I, we, we find anyways with a lot of people, they can just look at those adjectives and they're going, oh my gosh, you know, that's me. I'm on the deficient or the excess. And Sarah, I would suggest to, to women is that operating with strength of character is like walking on a balance beam. And that the excess side, you know, it's kind of, let's call it the right side falling off or the deficient side is the left. And you got to figure out what your leanings are. And here with character, you know, many people believe they're good people with good character, but they don't really understand how to diagnose it. So if I take myself as an example, which I often do, is under judgment, there's a word decisive. And I talk about, I am rarely indecisive. 
It is. So on that balance beam, I'm not going to be falling off on the deficient side. That's kind of a curious thing if I am. But what does that tell me? I really have to guard against the excess side. And that doesn't mean I want to dial down my decisiveness. It's really a very, very strong aspect of how I operate. But that does tell me I have to look to those other dimensions of character to be sure they're incredibly strong to support it. So under collaboration, being flexible, open-minded, or interconnected. And I use this example. I say, you know, when somebody asks me my point of view and I respond, there's my decisiveness. You know, if I know the answer to it, I'll be able to, you know, provide some perspective. I take that as the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But do they take that as the end of the conversation? Mm -hmm. And And that, I think, is the essence about where character leadership lies, because now I can begin to see if they don't see me as open-minded, flexible, and, you know, collegial and collaborative, then how is it that they see my decisiveness as an opening gamut on what we could talk about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the ways that women can assess is to look at those descriptors and on the deficient, what was the other side of the equation? Excess excess and deficiency um, side. And once they've got an idea of an area that they might need to beef up or tone down, did I get that right? Is that what they're doing is beefing up or toning down? You never want to tone it down. So that's a really important thing. So it's a bit confusing, I think, in the fact that when you talk about it's operating in the excess state, it's only doing that because it's not supported by something else. And that would be like, in you know, you think about muscles, if you started to develop them and you didn't have the core strength in your body, Mm -hmm. you might actually find yourself kind of compromised with those other muscles, but you don't want to weaken those muscles. You just want to build your core strength. And that's the same thing with character. Yeah. Okay. So I get that now. So tell me, tell me again, go back to this app. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how one would use it and where they can find it. Well, the app itself is available through through Virtuosity Character. I think it's .ca, but it could be .com. I should know that. And the what's in the app? The app provides a guided tour around those 11 dimensions of character and the behaviors and provides a daily exercise that one would be able to look at to develop that particular behavior. It helps the the person who's using it actually understand what character is. So one of the things, Sarah, that we've found is that there's so much knowledge and understanding about what character is, but it's not accessible. How do people know this? How do they learn about this? And we really wanted to put in the palm of the hands of individual everything we know about how to develop character and that they can have that kind of guided tour on their own. I think, though, some of your listeners might also be leaders who guide other leaders. And one of the things that becomes apparent in the app is that a lot of the systems of our organizations do not support the development of character. We undermine many aspects of these. And so part of the things that come out in the app is not just the development of the individual character, But a thought around what are the systems that we're operating in that may not be supporting us as well as we could. And I think for leaders who have that kind of accountability, they can begin to think about what kind of culture are they cultivating in their organization. So the the work around character not only is around individual development, but it's around organizational transformation. Okay. And that that leads into your claim that you could actually transform culture through you the development. All right, you say bet. more about say more about that. And I love that. I'm so happy you brought that up. I, you know, for those four decades, the area worked in a lot with strategy, uh, organizational renewal, culture change, and I have seen, you know. Decade after decade, organizations really struggling with culture change. And it was not until I actually understood character that I understood why. Because the culture of an organization will be a reflection of the character of the individuals within it, particularly its senior leaders. And what we have found is we've overweighted some of these dimensions like drive and accountability and integrity. Mm. 
And we never actually understood that those things could operate like a vice if we didn't bring along the humility, the humanity, the temperance, the transcendence to support it. So picture this is that if you want to rewire the culture of an organization, start with rewiring the character of the individuals within it. And then through that, we begin to see some of the systems that don't really work or align well. So imagine this. What, how do we hire You know, on the basis of character? No. You know, many organizations think they go, oh, well, of course we hire good people, but they don't actually have a systematic way of understanding what character is or how to develop it in the organization or how to reward it. So part of the way that we would talk about changing culture is, you know, fostering the development of character of the individuals in the organization and then addressing the systems that don't support it. Okay. And the systems that the opportunities for improvement in the systems tend to appear once the character starts to develop or do you have? Yeah, very quickly, because here's where they appear. We say, you know, wherever competence resides, character belongs. And so you just have to look at any place. So it's all your HR practices. It's your mm-hmm. selection, it's your promotion, it's your rewarding, it's performance management. So it's mm-hmm. all of those practices that you'd be thinking about. It's in places like the culture of the organization. It's in places like risk management and EDI and strategy. So virtu- And of course, all your leadership development or development in particular. So we spend a lot of time in helping We've got a practitioner program, kind of a train the trainer program through the IB Business School that helps leaders understand what it takes to embed this in an organization. And many of them are changing the all the curriculum. You know, how do we onboard people in an organization? How do we handle develop learning and development and particularly leadership development? Okay. So I could see how it would have an impact on equity, diversity, and inclusion if you view it as culture. But is there anything else specific to EDI that... It's hugely, you know, it's well beyond culture because most of the challenge on the EDI front, if you start to kind of scratch the surface, is around our character. It's around these core beliefs that we have that have been cultivated under you know, systems that have been designed, you know, for different groups of people. So think about how the very journey of character development might get you thinking about issues of justice, might get us thinking about issues of humanity, Mm. and what are your core beliefs about all of those things. So that's the journey that, Sarah, we find people on that they go, oh my gosh, I really didn't realize that I was operating this way. And I should add two two really important pieces about why it's been such a blind spot. Two things. We judge ourselves on our intention and others on their behavior. So people do not intend to act out on, you know, issues of DEI or how, you know, whatever ways we think about that acronym. Or they don't intend. But what's that observable behavior that's happening? It's like me and my decisiveness. You know, I don't want to you know, make something the end of a conversation, but what is it about my observable behavior that will enable that? And then the other piece is that research uh, reveals that 85% of us believe we're self-aware and only 10% are. So one of the things I think, Sarah, for your listeners around this is if you want to cultivate self-awareness, which is actually one of the behaviors under humility, A really good roadmap is start to work on your character and boy, will you start to get more self-aware about how you operate in the world. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I can see that. So Mary, in order to understand this and to be able to take even just a baby step to developing our own character, is there any question I should have asked you that I didn't? I think Really, the question, it's not so much that you didn't ask it, but it's the question actually for your your listeners. We've got something here that has shown by its empirical evidence to have incredibly important impact on 
our well-being and our performance, things like 10%, you know, increase in our resilience and job-related uh, well-being and our job satisfaction. And I look at, you know, 14% increase in leader effectiveness. There are not many things that we could invest in that will move the needle on these things as much as we do. So really the question is, why aren't we doing it? You know, my answer to that over 15 years is to every time I try to think about why aren't we doing it, to write an article that talks about it or to do things like put the virtuosity app out there or the leader character insight assessment, put the tools in the toolkit. And I have to believe that we've getting to a point that you know, having podcasts like this is that people will become aware of something that has been a blind spot for us that we really didn't understand very well. And yet it's as ancient as any area of study. You know, you go back, as I said, to, you know, Confucius, Aristotle, Plato, it's in things in our indigenous practices, like the seven grandfather teachings. And it is, it's one of these things that's been so prevalent but we've never ported it into leadership and organizations. So my hope, Sarah, is that with all the tools in the toolkit, people will listen to your podcast and say, okay, I want to get going on this. Very cool. So Mary, where can people find you? Well, there's lots of different places. So the IV Business School, that's spelled I-V-E-Y, there's a lot of tools and insights at ivy.uwo.ca slash leadership. The other place is that we ended up being able to start a consulting organization with people who have subject matter expertise to bring the strategic aspect of character into organizations. And people can find that at leadercharacterassociates.com. Of course, you talked about the Character Compass book. Boy, it's really a good roadmap. And that's available through the publisher Rutledge. Those are a couple of key resources, uh, Sarah, that I think can get people going. Great. Mary, thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the KTS Success Factor Podcast for Women. If you like what you are hearing, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate us, and leave a review. And if you would like more information on how we can help women in your organization to thrive, then go to www.sarahebrown.com. You can sign up for our newsletter, read show notes and learn more about our podcast guests, read my blog, browse through the books, or contact us for a chat. Goodbye for now. 